What's up? I'm Coach Dan Blewett. In today's video, let's discuss many of the cons to going D1 in baseball. So if you want to be a D1 baseball player and get recruited to play D1 ball, do you actually know what you're in for? And is this actually what you want? So in today's video, let's talk about some of the, the cons and some of the trade-offs that come with playing really big-time baseball, D1 baseball. All right, so let's jump into this. So number one reason or number one thing you need to really think about when you're considering, you know, if you have a D1 offer um, is do you know how much work this is? You're going to get up at 6 a.m. You're going to have workouts every single day, Monday through Friday, and also probably on Saturday in the uh, off season, um, you know, pending your like inner squad game schedule and all that stuff. But Monday, you're going to get up at like 530 or 6 and you're going to be in the pool. You're going to be on the track. You're going to be outside running sprints. You're going to be in the weight room. Then you're going to go to class from 8 to 12, something like that, 8 to 1. And then you're going to be at practice from 2 to 6. And then you're going to go to the dining hall. You're going to have a little bit of social time with your team. Like everyone's going to eat together probably. And then at 7 o'clock, you're going to have to kind of do schoolwork and make sure everything, your ducks are in a row. And finally just like sit down for the first time. That's your life. Every day for four years, that's your life. It's a very packed schedule. And more so than other sports because in baseball, especially in this, I mean in the spring, you're going to play 56 games in the 120 days of the semester. You know, football seems like, I remember talking to one of my, my high school buddies who went on to play D1 football, and I'm like, man, that must be so tough with all the travel. He's like, dude, baseball's way harder. He's like, we only play, you know, 12 games in our season. So he's like, yeah, you know, football is obviously like a really hard sport. Um, he's like, but we only travel once a week for a game. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're traveling five days a week for games. You know, you're going to have a Tuesday game, a Wednesday game, maybe a Thursday game. Then you're going to have your weekend series, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You know, you're definitely playing at least five a week. So it's a really rigorous schedule. You will absolutely not have a normal campus life. You will not get to go on spring break. You will not to get, get to be in, like, a lot of student groups and just, like, have this leisurely cool experience, which otherwise you get to, like, go to class for three or four hours and then just, like, have the rest of your day to sort of, like, do what you want to do, right? Kind of find yourself as a person. Your schedule is going to be extremely regimented, extremely busy, very packed. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved my D1 baseball experience, right? I played at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Go Retrievers. We were a small-time D1 program, very academic school, um, but we still had all the same rigors, right? If you go to like Mizzou or Alabama or UCLA, like one of these huge schools, the schedule is going to be still pretty similar because there's only so many hours of the day and then NCAA regulates what you can and can't do. But you're, you're going to probably have like maybe some more unique workouts or like, you know, just slightly different stuff. But pretty much all the D1s are doing the same amount of work. They're packing it in before class. You've got to have that schedule, that block of time for practice pretty much blocked off in the afternoon. And you're going six days a week, you know, rain or shine. And they, they fit a lot in. So just understand, is that really the student experience that you want in college? For a lot of players, they don't, right? Now, this can be the same at D2 programs. Um, D3 programs, they don't have nearly as rigorous of a fall schedule. They don't play as many games in the spring either. So it's a much more, I'm not going to say it's relaxed experience, but there's just like more space in your schedule. Um, I wouldn't say that they're more relaxed because I know so many D D3 programs are amazing and very serious about what they do, but there's just more space in the schedule. So you just have to ask yourself, is the D1 experience being very, very full of a schedule? Is that what you want? And again, for many of you, the answer would be yes. And that's great. I loved it. It was wonderful, but it's definitely not normal. It's not a normal experience for a college students. So just keep that in mind that it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be a D1 ball player. Number two thing you definitely need to know about going D1 is that you might not play. So you might not play as a freshman and then never again. You might just never see the field. You might play a little bit as a freshman, then a little more as a sophomore. Then they've kind of figured out that they don't think you're really that good. Like you hit 240 as a sophomore, you, you know, you go six and eight and you have a five, five ERA. And that's kind of it. They're not really that committed to you anymore. You're kind of getting older. They've got new freshmen coming in. So that's how it goes. There are lots of players, you know, from my tenure in college that I watch them go through this curve. They get some innings early, then they kind of plateau, then other kids behind them are, you know, better. And they're just kind of sitting the bench as a junior or senior. So for a lot of players who sit as a freshman, maybe they're like able to jump ship right away because they can get three more years at a different school, right? They can cut bait early. But if you like get a little bit of uh, playing time freshman year and then a little bit sophomore year, then junior year, you start sitting. It's like, 
you're already pretty far in your degree. Are you really going to transfer at that point? You'd kind of be stuck. And then just like your baseball career kind of comes to an end, either you quit the team or they pull your scholarship or you just stop playing and that's not real fun. Then you have to do all that work and you never see the field. So you have to understand there's a very real chance unless you get a lot of scholarship money that a, you might not get many chances because they don't have to play you. They don't have to ever push you on the, put you on the field. They just don't. Um, and your chances might be very limited. You might go out there and just absolutely suck your first couple of times out. And they're like, this guy can't play. And they're just kind of done with you. That happens. You don't realize how often that happens. So understand that if you go D1, especially if you're kind of fringy, like you're a walk-on. I was a recruited walk-on. I got no scholarship money to go there. Um, they gave me a couple thousand bucks later as a junior because I was the number one pitcher on the team at that point. But I didn't get any money to go there. So I had no expectations. They didn't have to put me on the field ever. Just understand if you don't get a lot of scholarship money, that's puts you on that very unstable footing of where eh, they don't care if they play you or not because they don't have any money invested in you. So just keep in mind that you might never see the field if you go D1. Number three, and this goes back to what we just talked about, new players will churn in every single year. So say you got a 35% scholarship. Well, guess what? The next class, there's two pitchers. Like say you're a pitcher, there's two pitchers that got 50% scholarship. That's a lot for baseball. Um, but guess what? They're now in the running to get more innings than you. And if you slip up a little bit or you get hurt, you might get paved over, right? So every single year, there's going to be new competition who are younger than you. So if you're you know, hitting 260 and there's a freshman that hits 260, they're going to take the freshman who hits 260 over the sophomore, the junior who hits 260 in a lot of cases because they're younger. They're going to get more. They're going to expect them to get better, right? And if you're a junior hitting 260, they're going to expect that's kind of you're like you're at the end of your career. You're not going to get a lot better probably, right? Obviously, there's always exceptions to that. So, you know, bear with me. But that's kind of how this works. So just remember, every new year, there's new players churning in to take your spot. And they're going to be younger. And if they have as much talent or more, they put up good numbers, they're going to get the nod in a lot of cases because youth and them extrapolating their ability over the next three, four years, like, man, we got to get this kid in the lineup because he's already pretty good. We want to get him to be, you know, all, all conference as a sophomore. So just understand that you might feel like you're, you finally hit your stride as a sophomore or junior, and then the next big thing rolls in and there you are. I mean, this happened to me in a way I was, like I said, I was like the worst pitcher on the team as a freshman. I did really well. I came back throwing like mid to upper eighties and we got a new sophomore who threw 91 to 94 from the left side. And he was six, one or six, two. He's a good friend of mine still. Um, but that was really frustrating and scary for me because I, I did all this work, had a great year, like really changed myself. And then I come back and it's like, oh, I went from like 80, to, topping at 83 to topping at 87. And here comes this new kid who throws 94. Great. That happens a lot. So just be ready for it. The next thing to talk about is the travel schedule. It's super rigorous. I know I've kind of touched on a lot of this stuff already. The travel schedule is crazy, especially in the spring. You have to be a really independent person to get your schoolwork done, they're going to hold your hand to an extent. They're going to force you to go to a study hall and all this other stuff. But I'll tell you, when you're in the spring season and you have to write a philosophy paper, I, had a, I studied philosophy, and you have to write a philosophy paper on the bus coming back from you know, New York or wherever, um, it's pretty hard to focus and get that done and want to get that done, especially when you're either on a happy bus where you just won and you want to sort of like bond and rah-rah about your win <laughs> that's the one hand. The other hand is like, you just sucked and everyone's sad and you just want to mope. And so you don't want to write your paper. You just don't want to write your papers either way or study for your tests. So understand that there's a, there's going to be majors that you just can't do at some D1 university. You just can't do them because they're going to have too many labs in the afternoon. This is really common with the sciences. They have a lot of lab stuff that you have to do at like the 300 and 400 level or 200 and 300 level, whatever. Um, and they're going to be at 2, two to 3.30 or they're going to be at 3.30 to 5. Like that's just when those things take take place. Because we, we had a kid on my team who did that. And he was constantly missing practice. And that was kind of okay at our program. We were a smaller D1. And we were more focused on players as the student part than the athlete part. But in other, other programs, that's not the case. It's athlete first and student second, even if they tell you otherwise. And that will just not fly. They'll just tell you, you cannot do pre-med if you want to play baseball at this school. You cannot do, you know, biochemistry if you want to do play baseball at this school. That's just a reality at many colleges. So you have to figure that out, number one. 
And say you only got three D1 offers, and that's the case at all three, that's just like not, A1 doesn't have your major, B, it's just like not gonna work out to do that major there. You might have to go play D3 baseball to like get that academic life that you want. This is a real trade-off that you have to ask on recruiting visits, and you have to kind of sniff this out um, as best you can in, in just the college identification process. But understand that there are some majors that your schedule is just gonna be ridiculous for. It just It's just super hard to be, a physics major and be a D1 baseball player because the, of the, the the drain on your time. Again, studying when you're gone all weekend, you're gone Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for weekend series in the spring. And then you've got games on Tuesday and, Tuesday and Wednesday too, and you practice on Thursday. It's just really hard. So understand that your academic life might not be compatible with some D1 schools. And lastly, the biggest reason to go D1 is because you desperately desperately want to figure out how good you are and you desperately want to compete against the absolute best players you can. That's not everyone. If you just want to play baseball and you really love it, don't get me wrong, you really love it, but there isn't this burning desire to go play pro baseball. This isn't there isn't this burning desire to like leave it all out in the field and and really figure out how good you could be, then D1 might not be best for you. College baseball is a great experience in general. D2, D3, JUCO, D1, doesn't matter, NAIA. So you're going to get most of the same stuff everywhere. And the other thing to remember is that you're not going to have a million fans in the bleachers at most D1 schools. My D1 school, we had 100 people every game. That was mostly moms and dads from both teams and girlfriends and a couple athletes that were like really close with, you know, close friends. That's the case on like schools number 300 all the way up to like number 100 or really up to number 50. You're not going to have an LSU experience unless you go to LSU. Every other school, they're not going to draw 4,000 people. It's not going to be a minor league ballpark playing D1. So the idea of getting this like college world series, amazing atmosphere, you know, more schools than ever have amazing locker rooms and amazing facilities. But if you go to most of their games, even these like big times, like, like really big name schools, like Northwestern is a good example, great program, like amazing school. You're not going to see a thousand fans at a Northwestern game. Like you're just not, you'll see a couple hundred maybe and they have an amazing ballpark. And there's like, it's that as an example, cause I've, I've been there great, great place to go, but you're not going to get a minor league atmosphere there. Right. It's an amazing place to play, but only LSU is LSU, right? Only UCLA is UCLA. So just understand that if you really want this like college world series experience, you're probably not going to get it from the vast majority of D ones, vast majority of D ones. You'll have very few people in the stands and you're still playing baseball. So it's not that different than like a D3 where it's mostly, you know, not, I was gonna say wives and girlfriends, but it's mostly girlfriends and parents. That's the, that's the bleacher situation in most places. So really it has to come from you. How bad do you wanna play against the best players? How much does your potential pro career matter to you? All that stuff, those are the big considerations. So understand that A, your, your time is gonna be incredibly crunched at the D1 level. You might not play. New players are gonna come and try to take your spot away every year. And that's the same, that's the same at every D1 program, but or at every program in general, but especially the D1 level, it's really cutthroat. Um, and then also you just need to decide how desperately important is the absolute top tier level of play. Because again, my bigger point was that you're still gonna get all the student athlete experience at D2, at NAIA, at the D3 level, all the having your teammates, the workouts, the bonding, all that athlete life, you're going to get that at all those other levels. The only thing that's really different at the, D3, at the D1 level is the level of play and the speed of the game and really the, the higher potential to go pro if that's something that's important to you, it's just because players are so much better there. So hopefully this video was helpful. I know it was a little bit long, but... It's, this is honestly a really important question to touch on. Everyone aspires to be a D1 player, but a lot of players don't know what that, what that means. And countless players get there and drop out. They transfer, they don't play, and they find out that it wasn't right for them, way more than you realize. And so this is an important conversation, especially if you're in high school, um, just to understand that you don't have to have a D1 experience to have an amazing college experience. You can have an amazing D3, NAIA, JUCO, D2, whatever, and feel really good about yourself, and you are an exceptional ball player if you go to those levels. So just remember, there's a lot of ways to have a great college experience. D1 is just one of them, all right? If you have any questions, leave them in the description below. Check out my books. If you wanna learn more about your journey and what you're gonna be facing, check out Clean Your Cleats, it's my newest one. I know you'll love it. And I'll see you here in the next video.